The hair rig might be one of the simplest rigs to tie, but that doesn't mean there aren't loads of different ways that you can get it wrong. The problem is, there's just so many tiny little details, so many permutations, and each one of these can ruin the finished result. In fact, when I first learnt to tie the hair rig, I made loads of basic little mistakes. So let's have a look at what can go wrong. You need to be careful that you don't whip the knotless knot the wrong way. What do I mean by that? Well, most hooks where, where the eye is made, there's a gap in between the, the hook closure where the eye meets the shank of the hook. And it's always on the one side the, of the hook and you don't want the first whip of the knotless knot to go over that. Now, if you're using thick mono or heavy braid, you know, that's going to be fairly tolerant of that. But if you're using thin mono or thin braid, then that point is going to create a stress concentration factor. And it's the first turn of the knotless knot that comes under the maximum load when it comes under tension. So if you've got material running over this gap, it can increase the stress at this point and it can cause the line to fail much sooner than it should do. So the material might be rated for you know, 20 pounds, but it, it can fail at a few pounds just because this concentration of stress is right next to the top of the knot. So I've passed the mono through, I've made a bait loop, I've threaded on a bait and I've put a hair stop in place. So it's at this point here where we need to pay attention as to which way round we, we do the whip. The shank of the hook is facing away from me, the point is closest to me, and the, the join in the eye is nearest to me. So I don't want the first turn of the knotless knot to be passing over that. I want it to be passing on that side. That's the safe side. When I take the hook like that and take the hook link, I'm going to be passing round the back and then over like that. So yes, that part of the hook link is also going to be going over the join, but it's gone round that side first and that side will take some of the load before that side comes under load. And if you do it like that, then you're far less likely to experience hook link failure just on that top side. That's the first turn there and that's passing over the safe side of the eye. And when I turn it over like that, it's that second turn that's going near the joint in the eye. So if you're doing it this way, this is wrong. So I'm passing, that's the front, that's the first turn going over the knot and then I'm continuing like that. It looks as though I've done it the same, but it's that first turn that's passing over the joint. And although I could probably get away with it with this thick heavy mono unless the rig came under extreme stress, if you always get in the habit of going the other way, the way I did it the first time, then you shouldn't ever have a failure at this point. The worst combination is if you're using finer braid, you know, fi maybe 15 pound braid, and you're whipping the knotless knot the wrong way with that first turn over the join in the eye. What's gonna happen is that when that knot comes under load, the braid is gonna get pulled in between that, that join, and it's literally gonna cut it in, in two and I've seen quite a few failures over the years. I've, I've had them myself, you know, I didn't always know how to do it right. The reason why I know anything is that I've gotten it wrong, I've made the mistake, and I've paid the price. So if you've ever suffered uh, an unexpected failure at the knotless knot, you've had a hook link go, my money is that it was probably because you've been whipping the knotless knot around the wrong way. So I've just stopped at this point and I've stopped just opposite the point of the hook there and you've got two choices as to which side you pass the hook link through the, the eye of the hook. Now with the point towards me here I call that side of the eye the back side of the eye and I call this side of the eye the front side of the eye. What you don't want to do 
is you don't want to enter the front and exit the back. If you do that, your knotless knot is going to look like that. And you might think, well, what's wrong with that? Surely that's going to work. Well, sometimes it will. You know, carp are caught like this. But more often than not, if I just give you a little finger test here, if I run that over there, the hook does not turn towards my finger at all. If I run it over my palm, again, the hook, if anything, actually turns away. So this one is an absolute classic. I've mentioned it in other videos and I've probably mentioned it in every single hair rig video I've ever made. But it's this single most basic fundamental mistake. If you exit out the wrong way, your rig is not going to be anywhere near as effective as if you do it the right way. It's simple as that. You'll catch many more if you do it correctly. Let's sort this out. So all we have to do is reverse that and then we go from the back side of the eye and exit out the front. We want to be exiting towards the point like that. So that interned eye is just going to be helping that hook to cant over a little bit more. If I do the finger test, you can see, although that, that point's pointing away from the finger, as soon as the eye gets to the finger, it's turned and grabbed. There we go, flipping over lovely. So even when the point of the eye is the wrong side, it gets the eye and it turns and grabs. That's how you want the hook to work. So this time I've stopped at this point here and I'm going to show you a mistake that I've seen anglers do when they attempt to whip two turns underneath the hair here. So in order to do this, what you need to do is maneuver the hair forward and then hold the knotless knot like that and then go under like that. Now, at that point, the mistake would be to go up from there. So I've exited out the, the correct side of the eye. There's no problem with that at all. But what's happened is I've trapped the hair. So that when I pull that, it completely changes the exit point of the hair. When I hold the bait up, the hook isn't hanging nice uh, and, and square at all. It's very much canted over, over to one side. So that means if the fish picks it up and it's over to this side of the mouth, it's just not going to work. If it does that side, that's going to be fine. But if the hook is hanging more vertically, you've got a much better chance of catching him no matter whether he turns his head left or right. So if that's wrong, how do we fix this? How do we make it better? So the mistake that I've made there is I've gone the wrong side of the hair. So to fix that, if I take the bait and pop that forward, like that, and then move the hook link over to there, and then put the hair back into place there, and then pass from the back to the front. When I draw that up, I've only gone one turn. Okay, right, we're nearly there. Forward like that. Go round again. Then put the bait over. And then the hook link needs to be on the far side. So that's the far side. That's the near side relative to me that is. Then we pass from the back to the front and then when I draw that knotless knot tight we can see that the hair exits the back of the hook absolutely perfectly. When I hold the bait vertically the hair hangs vertically, the point of the hook hangs completely vertically downwards like that. So you've got the carp's mouth like that 
whether the hook goes in the middle that's fine over to the one side that's fine over to the other side that's fine it's always going to work more often than not so the added benefit of doing a little two turn kicker like this is that it automatically cants the hook over at a fairly aggressive hooking angle when the hook link is tensioned you don't need anything else you don't need a, a kicker or anything like that while that's great if you can whip a couple of turns underneath the hair like that i've seen anglers you know they can do that up to that bit fine but they really struggle to do those two turns underneath the hair and to exit the correct side of the uh, the eye and, and avoid the trapping of the hair kind of pitfall so my workaround for that with any material is to add a blowback tube or a little hook bead so to add a blowback tube or a hook bead all we do is we stop at that point hold the knotless knot enter from the back pop it out the front towards the point and at that point we've got a perfectly regular knotless knot and you know there's absolutely nothing wrong with that at all but if you want to make it even better we can just take a little blowback tube uh, these are the medium size ones there's three different sizes of these it's 0.75 this blowback tube it doesn't matter whether you use the silk coloured or the diffusion camo coloured there we go little blowback tube on there and that works nicely with a with a size six stops the knotless knot rotating and it just helps to add a little bit of extra kick now like i did in the mono hair video you can of course do this with a little hook bead that works great as well i quite like the blowback tube because you've got more of a surface area in contact with the hook and that means that this tube is less likely to get pushed away or, or rotate on you so it holds it really nice and securely as long as you match the blowback tube to the size of the hook that you're using um, I also love these little things for for D rigs so you can use these for multiple rigs and I always like to get the best kind of use out of anything that I have in my box I also love the fact you get 50 in a packet whereas hook beads you might get 10 you might get 20 in a packet so better value for money and they're completely recyclable anyway so you can use them many many times before they end up getting kind of destroyed if you don't want to use a dedicated blowout tube you could also just cut up little bits of uh, old silicon tubing that'll probably work because the uh, internal diameter of most tubing sizes is 0.75 so if you've got some tubing lying around you know you can just cut a few bits of, of those up and use those to do exactly the same job if you're using a supple braid like armalink and you want to tie directly to the swivel here's a classic mistake that I've seen a number of anglers make which can dramatically reduce the actual effective breaking strain of that hook link. Now in most situations in carp fishing you know, this is probably not going to be an issue but when you're tackling a water like ours with massive catfish that pull really hard then everything has to be absolutely spot on and if you use the wrong knot for braid then it's going to slip and it might fail on you so I've just got a completely standard size 8 swivel here there's no ring on it but uh, yeah it could be could be either or it really doesn't matter what you don't want to do is you don't want to do a standard half blood knot so the standard blood knot is tied like this and then we pass through I can open up that loop a bit. We pass the tag end through that loop there just above the swivel. I pull that down a little bit and then I pull to tighten. There's two mistakes to make here. If you don't pull that hard enough and just give that a little tweak and think oh that'll do and then you take your scissors and then you cut the tag end way too short 
and then you don't go the extra mile of blobbing that if you put this under some force what's going to happen is that you can see the knot starts to slip so we can see what's happened the materials frayed a bit um, the material hasn't failed I mean this is 35 pound hook link but the knot has simply come undone it, it slipped I found that certain braids are, are more tolerant of this mistake than others uh, it's all to do with the surface friction the weave of the braid and the actual you know the fibers that the braid is made from basically I find armor link is it's quite good for gripping itself so I had to pull reasonably hard there to make that fail but it still absolutely did come undone some really smooth finer braids are absolute terrors for just kind of pulling apart under very little load so if you're going to tie supple braid direct to a swivel these are the golden rules always tighten that knot down really well wet it tighten it down and pull it as tight as you want it to be able to withstand in terms of the the amount of force get two rig pullers give it a really good pull you're not going to damage the material it's the, all about tightening it down once you've tightened it down cut the tag end too long there's no need to have it you know really short and really neat the carper is not going to care that you've left five mil of tag end once you cut the tag end to about five mil blob it now not all braided materials can be can be blobbed there are certain ones which just will not be able to be blobbed um, it's just the nature of the material you you can't blob them if you can successfully blob the material that will stop it fraying it'll also give it a little bit of extra so that if it does slip you know if you have made other mistakes in what you're doing the chances of that tag end actually pulling through the knot uh, are much reduced so if you're using a supple braided hook link and you want to tie directly to a swivel then use the double grinner that would be my advice to tie the double grinner you pass once through the swivel and then you go back through the swivel exactly the same way so we've gone through the eye of the swivel twice then what we want to do is we go away from the swivel and then make a loop back towards the swivel so that basically it looks like that then we take the tag end and we whip one two three for just enough to do five turns through there and then we pull on the tag end gently we get to about there and then we very gently tighten this down and we can see the whole knot sliding together a little bit more on the tag end pull that up like that continue pulling down then we get a couple of pullers and then we wet it nice good pull hook is flexing just a little bit there but massively strong these hooks anyway shows how much force I'm putting that under that's five mil a tag and there's no issue whatsoever with blobbing armor link it ends up to be about a three mil tag so cut at five blob down to three and all before I tightened it up that knot is not going anywhere and is perfectly capable of banking a very very large fish indeed that leads me neatly on to the next mistake that I see anglers make the problem is this when you put the knotless knot under tension between two pullers the knotless knot actually rotates and the exit point of the hair is now on the side of the hook where the point of the hook is rather than being where it should be round the back and the problem with this when I pick it up from the bait with the hair hanging vertically the hook again is canted over to one side it's going to work fine on the other side like that but half of the time 50 50 that rig is not going to work so how do we fix that all we have to do is we have to rotate the knotless knot and if I try and rotate it back towards me like that that's not going to work 
if I rotate it away from me like that it moves just fine. So all we do is rotate it back to where it should have been in the first place push the blowback tube up and this is another reason for using these little blowback tubes and that puts the exit point of the hair opposite the point which is exactly where it should be. When I hold it vertically that hook is hanging vertically which is exactly where I need it to be. If I want to tie some 0.50 mono to this ring swivel here I am going to use the half blood knot because the half blood knot works very well with mono because the mono does not slip. One, two, three. Now a three turn blood knot might not sound like a very good choice or very strong but actually in thick mono a three turn blood knot is very strong indeed. I'll just pass that through there like that, tighten that down, Got a really good pull. I can see that the mono has started to uh, compress in on itself and you get this kind of tapered effect and that's absolutely locked solid. Very, very strong that. Now, I'm not concerned about this mono slipping at all. So, you know, you don't need to cut it long and then blob it back. You're just as likely to burn the mono doing that. So, no issues at all in just cutting that two or three mil long. As long as you've tightened that down, that knot is not going anywhere. Once you've picked what hook and what hook link material you are going to use, normally the next step is to you know, mark off the amount of material that you're going to use for your rig, cut it and tie the rig. Now, while this isn't the worst crime in the world, it's certainly going to hurt your wallet over the long term if you always cut that same amount of material. Now, if you're very familiar with the rig that you're going to use and you don't vary rig length at all, then, you know, fine, of course, you know, crack on, cut it to that length and it's always going to come out to be the right length. But if you have to kind of chop or change or you use, you know, different length rigs for different situations or, you know, you've never tied the hair rig before and you just have no idea how much material is actually consumed by doing, you know, six eight ten twelve wraps around the shank of the hook or you have different size loops all of these little variables add up and can make a big difference the last thing you want to do is to basically waste material you know, the really weird thing is that many videos on the hair rig tell you to you know pull off half a meter or whatever of material uh, and go from there and you always kind of see them finishing the rig and then cutting off a load uh, and, and wasting it. If you change the sequence in which you tie the basic hair rig you can make that decision right at the last minute. So this is how I originally learnt how to tie the hair rig. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take some material, I've got some 25 pound armor link and I'm going to measure off a length. I'm just going to go corner to corner on my rig tray. Cut that off then I'm going to grab a size 6 twister. Obviously I want to check the point to start with. So I'm going to take the armor link and I'm going to go from front to back. And I'm going to pull some through. I'm just going to kind of leave the hair long. So that leaves me hopefully enough space to tie a loop to mount a bait. And it's just a complete guess. Then we're going to do a hair rig. I'm going to whip away from the eye. parallel to the point. Then we're going to go from the back and exit the front. So we've got our rig and uh, I can see that uh, you know, I made a reasonable guess this is definitely long enough to to make the rig. Then I want to mount a bait and the bait I'm going to use a 24mm bait. So what I'm going to do I'm going to fold over the material until the material is just at the knot there just at the base of the knot on this knot and then I'm going to try and tie a loop and this is where sometimes handy to have a, a boily needle. I don't normally need to use a boily needle to tie a loop because I don't do it like this anymore. But when you're doing it this way, it can be quite helpful. Right, we've got something going on there. I'm going to grab a puller, give that a bit of a tweak. And then if I offer up my bait, then yeah, 
Not a bad guess that, I think that's going to work. Now all they need to do is pierce that bait, go on the bait loop there, slide the bait on, carefully pull the knot into the bait, pull a little bit out so that I can see the loop there, and grab a hair stop, pull the hair stop into the bait. So that's the way I used to do it. To be honest, I'm amazed that that rig looks as good as it as it does. Uh, I can guarantee that my my rigs when I first first used to tie them definitely did not look like that. Uh, they were always way too long or way too short, or it was just it was a bit of a mess really. Many 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 years of practice, and you know maybe I got lucky on the guesswork today. Can you do it? Yeah. It's just a bit kind of fiddly and awkward and when you're, when you're learning, it's not the easiest method to learn. If I want to finish that rig off, what I do is I take a size 8 ring swivel and this, this is your mainline swivel. Obviously this is not connected to any mainline or any leader at the moment, but basically I'd go through there and I go through again and I'm going to tie the double uni knot or the, the double grinner. Pull that through to there, go back on myself, start whipping round. Tie that up, nestle it down. So that's the finished result. The rig has ended up you know, from the base of the hook to the uh, ring of the swivel there, nine inches. So I might be a bit rusty tying them that way, but actually that's a perfectly usable rig and will definitely catch me a carp. So let's have a look at a better way of tying the basic knotless knot rig. So this time I've got the armor link, but I'm gonna leave it on the spool. I've just pulled off some material so it's not exposed there. Take another twister, wet it to help pass it through from the front to the back. And I'll make the very first job to tie the bait loop. I'm going to do a single 24mm bait. I want the knot to be in the middle of that bait. I tie the loop and this time I don't need the baiting needle because I can actually get my fingers around it. That's the loop set up there and that's going to appear just in the middle of the bait and I can just tease that one way or the other to adjust that. Get my knot puller, give that a little tweak, trim the tag end. Then the next thing I do is I grab the bait and thread the bait on. Hook it on, carefully draw it in. I've got a bait on a bait loop, bait stops in place and I've got the hook but I can decide what hair length I want. So to set this up I put my nail opposite the point just at the same height there and this forms a gap between my index finger and thumb. If I take the hook link and I draw the bait up, the bait sits in between my finger and thumb and it goes to the same height every time. Once I draw that in, I then start whipping the knotless knot. And because my fingernail is just opposite the point, I whip down right there. That guarantees that the exit point of the hair will be exactly opposite the point where I want it. At this point, I can then do a measurement so I can decide how long I want this rig to be. Say I want this rig to be identical to the other rig. Put the bend of the hook on the zero there. And we go up to nine, in nine inches, 23 centimeters. Now it's no good me cutting the material there because I don't have the enough material to tie the five turn griller. This is where you need a bit of experience because you need to know how much material is consumed by your version of the five turn griller. So I'm going to guess that I'm going to go to there on my box, about 13 inches in total. And this is where you, you run out of fingers because you can't let go of that and you need to transfer your arm there so you can use a pair of scissors. So I just clamp that finger onto the back of that finger and then go through there like that. Okay, so I just wet the end of the material to make it easier to thread and I pass from the back, exit the front, pull that through and we have a little look. That is the distance that I always have my bait from the hookup. 
So you can see that it's very very similar. The first one I did was slightly tighter. Will it work? Of course it would. The advantage of the second method is that there's much less in the way of guesswork. I can absolutely guarantee the hook bait is always going to be in the same place relative to the bend of the hook. It's never going to be too tight, it's never going to be too long. If I change hook bait sizes, you know, is that rig going to work? No. You know, I don't mess around with these extender stops or whatever, I just can, you know, I just tie a new rig. So I'm just going to do exactly the same double grunner connection onto a ring swivel, just in the way I always do, and let's see how that rig length actually worked out in the end. So the bottom rig is the first rig that I tied, and that knot came to 9 inches. The second rig, I tried to replicate that rig, but in actual fact the rig is overshot by inch and a quarter, 3 centimetres. Did I get it right? No, not exactly. But if I wanted to get all of these rigs the same, it's a lot easier to guess just that last bit because the differences that you're going to get in your guesses are going to be far, far fewer. So when I tied that first rig, say for instance that I actually wanted the rig to be, you know, five inches, six inches long. But I cut the material at the length I cut it and I just picked a figure out the air to be honest because uh, it's a long time since I've tied rigs like this but if I had have wanted to achieve that six inch rig I'd have had to cut off three inches of this first rig material and I'd have wasted those three inches of material whereas with this method okay I, I actually made the guess wrong in order to hit the nine inch target but once I've learnt that lesson once I can take that into the next one and if I want to hit nine inches then you know I can cut off the exact length of material I need I'm not wasting any material you know you don't want to be binning this stuff unnecessarily every rig that's a waste so here's, uh, here's something that I've seen done before and it's really not a very good idea we've got a rig here that we've tied up with a 24 mil bait and I've got two 15 mil baits here and I've seen guys basically take those two baits and try and fit them onto this rig. Let me do that for you and let's see what happens. Right, so I'm just going to carefully pop the hair stop out there. There we go. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly how I thought it would uh, go. So, is it possible? Yes, but you can see that the baits are now sitting very, very tight to the uh, bend of the hair. I'm not saying that's not going to work, but it's not going to behave like that single bait rig version did with plenty of bait separation there. So, if you want to go from one bait to two baits, just retie the rig. Now we've, we've got lucky with this in that the top loop has actually gone into this top bait so it's pinning these together but if the bait loop was shorter and the bait loop was down there this top bait here would basically be sliding around and then it's going to be interfering with the hook and you, you don't want that situation. If we wanted to make a rig with double baits this is how I do it. Let's take some arm link and again I'm leaving it on the spool from the front to the back and this time I want to tie a bait loop for a double 15 mil bait and I want the knot to be in the middle of the top bait. So if I put that on the puller there I want the knot to be in the middle of that top bait and that's going to work fine. Again, I'm going to thread the two baits on. Now the length of that loop would be slightly different. It depends what style of hook stop you're using. You know, are you using a little extender stop? Are you using a, a regular bait stop which you just kind of 
mount on the outside of the bait. All these little factors make a difference. So I'll pull that up like that. Just enough so I can see the bait loop. Have a bait stop. Now we can see that when I slide that top bait onto the bottom bait, these two baits are pinned together. The top bait, I haven't got the tag end sticking out the, the top there, which is nice, just makes it look neat. And these two baits then move as one, which is exactly what I want to create. Then I'm going to do the same trick with lining up my nail. So the nail goes opposite the point. I draw the baits up, they stop there, perfect. Whip the knotless knot. So I'm going to pinch that at 30 centimeters, 11 and 3 quarter inches, and I'm going to cut it there. Thread from the back to the front. Grab a ring swivel and hopefully if I tie the five turn grinner the way I always tie it this is going to come out at nine inches. So first of all I've got a nice separation between the baits and the hook that's lovely that is. Put the bend of the hook on the zero, take the ring and okay all right my knot is eight millimeters too short so close it doesn't matter don't try and make a single bait rig work with a double bait rig yes you can do it but it's just not going to be the same every time you catch a carp on a rig that you've tied in a specific consistent repeatable manner you get more confident with it the other mistake that i've seen made is when anglers forget to take into consideration the material that they're using for the rig that they're tying you know if you're used to tying a rig a certain way with a supple braided rig you cannot just grab a coated braid or a mono or a fluorocarbon and tie the rig in the same way with the same hook and expect the same results. Different materials react very differently when you knot them. You just can't swap from one to the other. This is an example of what I'm chatting about here. This is a size 8 Nash Twister with an interned eye hook, this is 20 pound fluoro link and the effective gape is the distance between the point and the hook link and I've just tied this as a little knock up rig here and if I just try and place my, so my finger is representing a carp's mouth and if I just try and get that to engage it's not really biting very very far the my finger can't get close to the eye of the hook and I'm really just it's just catching on catching on the edge it is catching but we can do a lot better than that let's have a look at a size 8 fang x again with a 20 pound fluoro link again same piece of my finger and I'm getting that in there and again the the hook is is just snagging just about but takes a bit of wiggling before my finger will get engaged. If your hook's a razor sharp and it does snag and grab, then as it comes under tension, yeah, it's going to cant over. But again, there's just the possibility, especially on a big carp, that you're not going to get that hook point to engage. It's going to be protected. So I'm going to use my little finger here to represent the lip of a small carp. And it grabs my finger really, really quite well. No issues at all. It's more of a problem when you start to fish for really big carp. This would be my preferred setup. This is a size 8 Nash Shod Twister with an outturned eyed hook. Tied this in exactly the same way. I haven't steamed or straightened these at all. My finger goes closer to the eye before anything happens, basically. It just grabs more of my finger by default because the effective gape is wider and that's what I want to see from my carp rigs. 
So I don't use fluoro, but if you do, the hook choice that you pair it with really does make a difference. Yes, you can fix these problems with steaming or shrink tube or a kicker, devices like that. But if you just keep it really simple, you shouldn't have to. Use an outturned eyed hook and stick with a straight shank and you won't have any problems. The problem with this combination is because of the nature of the angle between the shank and the hook link, it's the bend, the lower bend point of the hook that's going to be presented to the bottom of the carp slip first. And that's not what I want. I want the point of the hook to be presented there first. Otherwise, it's just going to kind of rub and skid and never going to hook. Now, sure, if that rig goes far enough into the carp's mouth, is it going to hook them? course it does but it's certainly a combination that I would never use in my angling because I think I've got better combinations that give me a higher chance of success. The other downside of this arrangement is that the gate can get closed down and closing the gate that's, the, that's not the right direction to go in we want to make that gape as large as possible because it gives us the best chance of that rig going in turning and catching hold. Another popular option of course is to strip some of the coated material off a coated braid and, and thread that to, through because it solves the problem. But I don't use a lot of coated braids. The only time I would use a coated braid is straight through without any coating stripped off and that's in a multi-rig. If you're using a curved shank hook then I see absolutely no point in adding a kicker and making a, you know, that really kind of long curved effect. Uh, it's just something I wouldn't do. I think it's closing down the gape. I think it's costing you chances. Yes, of course, it occasionally works, but it, it's not a configuration that I'd ever use or advocate that you use. I think there are better ways of doing it. A curved shank hook can also be made to work with thin monos, but if you're going to do that, you're going to have to change the exit angle. And the easiest way to do that is to add a little bit of shrink tubing and actually steam it straight. So it's not a kicker as such, it's a straightener. The trouble is that every time you tie a new rig, you're going to have to use another bit of shrink tube and re-steam it into place, which can be a bit of a faff. A short little piece of shrink tube that steams straight into position will maintain the effective gape, and that's the important thing, it's the effective gape of the hook. This is going to give us more chance of hooking that carp when he does suck that rig into his mouth. One of my all-time favourite patterns of hooks would be the Nash Twister in a size 6. That's got a little, it's a short shank with a little in-turned eye, but I'd never try and use it with a, a mono or any kind of stiff material like that. I'd certainly be happy to pair it with a supple material such as the Armour Link or any other supple braid, that's going to work great. During the winter I use a lot of the size 8 and size 10 long shank twisters and those have got a smaller eye and I find that a smaller eye works well with the thin monos like the Zigflow in 12 pounds. I find the eye size of the standard twister in a size 6 to be quite generous. That's great for 25 pound or even 35 pound material but when I try and use that with thin monos in 0.35 or even 0.3 has a bit too much space and it affects the exit angle of the hook link. During the main part of the carp fishing season the hook that I turn to the most often would be a size 6 Nash Chod Twister. I'm a massive fan of the classic outturned eyed hook and those are the style that I use the most of during the season when I'm out fishing the larger lakes and reservoirs of France. I like an outturned eyed hook because by default the eye size is slightly larger. That means that they work with a wide range of materials. I regularly make a size 6 Nash Chod Twister work with mono of 0.50 or at a push even 0.60. This is super heavy duty material but these are the kind of materials that I need to use near rocks and especially rocks that are covered in the dreaded zebra mussels. While the Chod Twisters work really well with heavy materials I wouldn't ever pair them with a lightweight mono of 0.35 or 0.30. They just don't work very well because again it's that large eye size means that the hook link is going to exit without much control through the eye of the hook and yeah, yeah I can fix it but I just shouldn't have to. Just use a different combination of hook, link and material. You might not think that an outturned eyed hook 
would work with a material like Bray because we're always told that you, know, you must have that interdyed hook or you must use a kicker and you, you don't have to at all, you really don't. Caught loads of carp on nothing more than a basic outturned eyed hook and a bit of braid. It works. If you found this video on hair rig mistakes useful, watch this next one where I go a bit broader and cover all sorts of other mistakes that I've seen anglers make over the years.